Welcome to an oral history of the church. I'm Adam Crispin. And I'm Jonathan McCormick. An oral history of the church is a conversational history podcast. This first volume is an oral history of the campus relocation of Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary's main campus, from Mill Valley, California, to Ontario, California. The school has a new name as of June 2016, Gateway Seminary of the Southern Baptist Convention. The 10th episode for this volume is an interview with recent alumnus Anne Marie. J. Mac, uh, Anne Marie is a hard working, uh, I think, model alumnus for the seminary. Certainly. She, uh, the whole time she was here, uh, well, she started, I think, after I began my PhD and graduated before I did, which only burns a little bit. Uh, <laughs> but every time I talked to her about how classes were going, she always impressed me with her work ethic and her positive attitude towards getting it done and, um, being able to have those tools in hand, those, these, the tools that this education gives you to, uh, interpret the scriptures and work with people and all of the things that come with a seminary education. Certainly. There's a perception of students who do intercultural work with the, the seminary that they choose to do it because they can't really hack it with the biblical languages <laughs> or with the philosophical nuance of theologians. Anne Marie shows that this is not really the case. Yeah. She was able to hang with uh, the best of them in all of her classes. She's a, a really intelligent woman and, a, as you were saying, a very hard worker, both uh, for the advancement of the gospel and to do academics well. That's right. Well... We won't belabor this too much, so let's get to it already with Anne-Marie. This is Jonathan McCormick and Adam Crispin interviewing Anne-Marie on May 16th, 2016. She has requested us withhold her last name. The interview has taken place in the middle conference room of Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary Library, Seminary's Library at 201 Seminary Drive. Mill Valley, California. And Marie, uh, thank you for sitting down with us. We're really grateful for your time. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, as you know, we're doing a, a history project. Um, this first one is a uh, history of the, of the seminary in its final years at this particular campus location. So we have a series of questions in our template that we've been asking everyone. Uh, some of them will be more relevant to you, some of them will be less relevant to you. And um, so feel free to take them as you will and answer them as briefly or um, as long as you would like. Uh, so with that being said, our first question is, how did you first hear about Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary? I'm not sure exactly the first time I heard about it, but I know that I learned about it when I was living in Southern California, and a couple of the men that were with the Brea campus were visiting our office in the San Diego area and had mentioned the school mm -hmm. and actually had given me some information on becoming a student, mm -hmm. uh, but it wasn't something that I was interested in at the time. <laughs> One of those, okay, that's nice kind of conversations. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I took the information that they gave me. I filed it away. I may have even held on to it, but I filed it away just as something that um, wasn't of interest to me pursuing at that time. Mm -hmm. How did you first come to study or work with Golden Gate Seminary? I had lived overseas and I was thinking long term about what I wanted to do. I've uh, lived and served in a lot of different locations in a lot of different settings. And as I prayed about doing something for a long period of time, I wanted to um, go back to school and thinking about 
um, what I enjoy and that sort of thing, I was like, well, you know, it kind of makes sense for me because I've been involved with ministry for a long time, but I've never been to seminary. And long term, it really kind of makes sense for me to go back to school, which, as I said, I didn't think I would ever do, mm-hmm. um, and to get a seminary degree. So that's kind of how I ended up here. And looking at the different Southern Baptist seminaries that are around the country, I kind of looked at different aspects of them and different locations and different settings and uh, just different things like that. And partly because I had been invited to come to Golden Gate Seminary a few years earlier and because of the location and the programs and the diversity, um, that was the reason that I selected Golden Gate Seminary. Hmm. How long have you studied And how long have you been employed by the seminary? I've been on campus as a student for about three and a half years, and I've been employed by the seminary for a little over three years. Mm -hmm. And what is your current role at Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary? I am the administrative assistant to the David and Faith Kim School of Global Missions. Yeah, that's right. So a lot of folks uh, get a lot of help from you then as they come in and interact with the faculty and programs administered through that wing. Is that right? That's correct. I work with students who are uh, in the missions program. They could be missiology students. They could be intercultural students. They could also be uh, MDiv students uh, who are interested in missions. Mm -hmm. Um, Do you want me to talk a little bit about some of the things that I do in my job? Or Sure, yeah. Uh, Uh, You help coordinate events, is that right? I do. The two biggest things I do every year are the missions conference, which takes place in February and that uh, is campus-wide. Not only do we invite students and faculty and staff to participate in that, but we also have a lot of outsiders that come in and they learn about missions and they learn about uh, whatever the the topic is of the year Mm -hmm. um, and which changes every year. And so we have... Um, 100 to 200 people at least that come to that event. Uh, Some travel in from a far distance and some are students that are um, all interested in missions. Mm -hmm. The other annual campus-wide event that I help out with is Intersect. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, it's it's Intersect. uh, And that is more of an intercultural type conference. And then that that is a shorter conference, but it works with... um, local churches and how to eat outreach to people in a multicultural way. Mm. Yeah. Well, those are um, very impactful, very important conferences for the the annual life of the seminary. And uh, we've had one or two interviews for our podcast where folks have told us that they've come specifically for those. And that's some of their earliest contacts with the seminary was they came as a college student or bringing a college group to um, a missions conference or intersect, one of those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. What degree program are you in again? Uh, Master of Missiology. Thank you. All right, so what are some of your favorite memories of either studying or working or both here at this location with Golden Gate Seminary? I think because I've lived in a lot of different places and done a lot of different things over the last um, 12 to 15 years, I needed a spot where I could just sort of dig in and experience community and that sort of thing. And I felt that from the very first day I arrived on campus. Mm -hmm. And being able to live in one location for three and a half years, and yes, that's a long time for me. has been amazing. Um, I met one of my friends who at the time was my next door neighbor. I met her the day I arrived. I knocked on her door because I needed help unloading my car. (laughs) And within a few minutes, there were five girls unloading my car. And we were done um, probably in 20 or 30 minutes, something that would have taken me all night to do. (laughs) Um, Having the deep friendships that I've had has been amazing. And to be able to knock on a next door neighbor's door or to go down the hall and, you know, whether you need 
something to cook with or if you just need someone to talk to, someone to study with, or someone to go for a walk with because you've just been studying forever. Um, (laughs) Having that Christian community, I've never lived um, in the dorms or on a campus or anything like that. So having the Christian community just even right at home has been really meaningful for me. Mm. So I've been able to just build some neat relationships that I know that I'll have for many years to come. Yeah. So you you didn't experience a four-year college experience where you were on like a Christian college campus like in the in the in a dorm setting for example or a, like an on-campus apartment you didn't go through that? I didn't. Uh when I went to school, I lived at home for the first 2 years and went to a um community college. And then the last two years, I went off to university, but I lived off campus with roommates, um, but I never lived on campus. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I didn't also, I didn't go to a Christian school. I went to a a public university. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's real interesting to me. Um, Do you have any other, anything else you'd like to share on that before we move on? I I just want to give you time if you... If you had more just things that are say. meaningful. Yeah, mm-hmm. like some of your favorite, some of your favorite things about your time here. I think the community has just been, which is what I've talked about, but that yeah. has just been really deep very for impactful me, for very you. impactful for me. When you move so much and you only live in a place for, you know, the the shortest amount of time I lived in a, a city was overseas for five months, and then the mm-hmm. longest place I have lived in the last 12 or 15 years, like I was saying, was three years. And when you live in a place for five months or eight months or one year, you can have friends and you can build relationships and you can do things to experience where you live, but you can't put down roots Mm -hmm. um, and you can't really get highly involved because you know you're going to be leaving soon. So having the ability to have deep friendships and to get involved with church and community and and just all the different things that go along with that has really for me been the major um, impactful thing for me. I mean, don't mm. get me wrong; the school has been amazing, and the things sure. that I've learned and the things that God's taught me through all of that. But to be able to stop and be in one place has been very impactful for me. Mm. Well, on a, a related note, um, what is your most prized achievement that you've earned while at this campus? My Master of Missiology. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It's three, coming three this years, Friday, right? It is. It is. Three plus years of studying, uh, and I know I could have gotten the degree faster, um, but because of the move, I slowed down. I mm. agreed a long time ago to continue to work uh, in my job until the campus moved so that um, my boss wouldn't have to look for a replacement for me a couple of months before we left and that sort of thing. So, yeah, yeah definitely my degree um, <laughs> is the most prized thing. But, again, yeah. it's the relationships and it's the experience of having gone through working towards your degree with other Christians and what you learn through that. Mm-hmm. Before the announced sale of the Mill Valley campus, April 1st, 2014, what was your impression of the relationship between the seminary campus at Mill Valley and our neighbors? Um, I knew things were strained just because some of the conversations that I had heard, but I really didn't know a whole lot about what was going on. I had maybe been here for a year when when that was announced mm-hmm. and and knowing just a little bit of what I had heard and or overheard um, I, I, I was surprised but not shocked mm-hmm. um, and my initial reaction was, you know I think it's it's the right thing to do mm-hmm. um, does that answer the question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we for for me at the time I thought there would be a strong negative reaction from mm-hmm. students and staff and faculty um, because of how we value our our time 
here, our experiences at this location, um, <laughs> we can sometimes put the two uh, as one when really they're not exactly synonymous. Mm -hmm. But consistently, as we conduct these interviews, we're discovering that person after person after person had a very similar reaction where they thought, oh, that's today. Oh, well, I guess it had to come. This is a good idea. Like that's yeah. essentially, we hear that same kind of three-part response yeah. consistently, and it just surprises me. I, I, if you had asked me before we started these interviews, mm -hmm. I would have said, yeah, we're going to get a lot more people saying I had a negative reaction at first, or at least at, least at first, if not still. <laughs> yeah. I, I did find the humor. You have to look at the humor and everything uh, in the date yeah. of the announcement on April 1st. And I can remember having conversations with a few people beforehand of like, okay, so if it's being announced the way that it is and signs are going up and you have to be there and it's a required meeting and, and you're like, this is either a really big April Fool's <laughs> joke or this is a really <laughs> important announcement. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I again, it was a little bit of, of shock, but more of a wow. But at the same time, just even processing through it as I was sitting in that meeting, I can just sort of remember, um, this is a good thing. Hmm. This is, even based on the little that I knew of the history of, of why it was taking place. Mm -hmm. yeah. Has your perception, your opinion on that changed at all in, in the time that's, uh, gone on have you has it been about the same have you become more confident in that have you become maybe less confident thinking well no maybe there was a way for us to save the the buildings and and still educate students I really do think it's the best decision mm -hmm. seeing and hearing the things that I have to commend Dr. Orge and the leadership team because they've kept us very well informed. They've communicated with us. They've answered questions. They've mm -hmm. addressed um, emotional issues. They've, yeah. ad they've addressed packing issues and just about everything <laughs> in between. Yeah. And I have to thank them for that. Um, do I think it's the right decision? I really do because... Living on campus, working on campus, studying on campus, the the buildings are outdated. The technology is outdated. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of money going into upkeep for something that probably in some ways, whether it's the housing or whatever, probably needs to be torn down and redone. You know, there's been electrical issues. There have been leaking issues. There have been uh, – the technology is not good. Yeah. So in a lot of ways, we're – it's almost like stepping back in time when coming to this campus. And in some ways, I like that. Mm. Um, but when it comes down to the study and the practicality of how you learn, mm -hmm. it's challenging. Mm -hmm. When you have too many students that can't get on the Internet or they can't access things and they can't do things and they can't complete assignments and they mm -hmm. can't do this because that guy's already doing this. Or, you know, so... So from that aspect, um, I, I think we really do need to move forward. And, mm -hmm. and the other thing that I have to commend the leadership team for is thinking forwardly. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's not about the building or the location or the deer on campus or the view <laughs> and things like that. It really is about training leaders for the future, mm -hmm. not putting money into upkeeping something that needs to be either completely renovated or started over from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. You've been an answering a bit about uh, your thought of the sale and the the facilities. Um, have Let's move a little bit back to relationship between the community. Mm -hmm. um, has your perception of the relationship between the seminary and the community changed, both, you know, our general physical neighbors and the churches in the area since you and your position 
have a fair amount of networking with um, area church leaders and things like that. Um, Do you think the surrounding community, including especially the, the church leaders and whatnot that contact you for uh, job purposes, but also just generally the neighbors nearby, do you think that that's uh, the relationship between us and them shifted in any way, um, in any particular direction after the sale was announced? Um, and if so, like, how do you think the those church leaders or these community neighbors near us are considering us now? I don't know as much about the church leaders and okay. how to answer that question. I'm mm -hmm. thinking about some of the churches that are maybe closest to the seminary, but then also the church that I attend, which mm -hmm. is a little bit further away. And I know maybe one of the strongest things, I don't know what the right word would be for them, is the fact that they're losing student leaders and or professor leaders. Mm -hmm. So people who have served in our local churches, um, whether in pastoral roles or other servant roles, um, are not going to be there anymore mm. because they have to move because the seminary is moving and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so I think that can be a challenge, especially the fact that so many of the churches in Northern California aren't very large to begin with. Yeah. So that can be a challenge from staffing and then from also for those who are involved in the ministry of their local churches. From a community standpoint, it's interesting to see some of the comments and actions and reactions that the community are having um, not so much about the seminary moving, but about what's going to happen to the property once the seminary does move. So I, I know that there's a lot of people who are very unhappy with future plans for the property, but I don't know what role the seminary will have in that right. role and or responsibility once it's not located here yeah. at this address anymore. Yeah, we're thinking more about specifically between the announcement on in 2014 to today, like that kind of time period. Would you? Do you think you would change your comments at all, focusing in on that? I don't know how to answer that question. That's I'm okay. Sorry. Thank That's you. Fine. That's all right. Okay. Can we move on to the next one? Is yep. that all right? Yep. Um, this is a question we ask everybody. Uh, were you in on the discussions surrounding the potential sale before it was finalized? I was not. No. Uh, and you've already shared your opinion about the sale at that time. That's our next question. Okay. Um, so if that's all right with you, Jonathan, we'll move to the next one. It is now just um, a month or two before the vast majority of the seminary leaves this location and heads to Ontario and the surrounding communities. Has your opinion about the sale changed since it was an announced? I know we already kind of asked this, but this is, <laughs> we did a little bit out of order. Sorry. <laughs> but this is where we are. I'm not very good at this, apparently. <laughs> That's all right. I actually, I think I actually made that mistake here. But has your, has your opinion changed at all since the announcement of the sale? If anything, I probably feel more strongly that it's the right decision. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. As we're, the seminary is planning to move forward, uh, everyone has dreams of what will come, come ahead. Uh, what do you hope the seminary will prioritize as they make this historic transition? As Gateway Seminary or as the future seminary, what uh, will they prioritize? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Training leaders, preparing them for being pastors and leaders and missionaries and other um, people who can serve through their churches, but um, serve people, mm -hmm. share the gospel. 
That was Anne Marie, recent alumnus of Gateway Seminary. I enjoyed hearing some of the behind the scenes work of what happens at the Kim School and the intercultural studies department at the, the seminary. Yeah. She worked at least as hard, I think, in her job as she did in her education, her own personal education. Uh, there's a lot of hours that went into that position and a lot of hours probably uncompensated because it just took so much and they only had so much budget. We've heard from multiple people through this interview process, like Jared, that this was really what brought them to the institution. Mm -hmm. And so intercultural studies is a big component of what makes Golden Gate the special place that it was. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. And I, it'll be interesting to see what Gateway will look like. We don't quite know yet. You and I are recording this at the very beginning of the month of July. And um, Gateway has just received its new name, uh, permission from the, the Southern Baptist Convention. Um, the way that it works, we all learned this together here at Golden Gate because it was the first time it happened in our denominational history. The way it works is that a seminary who wishes to change its name will uh, request that at the National Convention, and they will vote on it one year. And if that vote is positive, then all they need is to have that happen all over again a second year. So the second year was this last June, just a few weeks ago now. They brought it up again and requested the name change, and each time they presented the specific name they wanted, which, as we mentioned earlier, is Gateway Seminary of the Southern Baptist Convention. So last year it was approved, and this year it was approved. And so that new name has gone through. But we don't know how much of that culture will continue. Correct. Uh, Anne-Marie played a vital role in a, a department that played a vital role in the 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 character of the seminary. Um, will that continue in the same way? We don't quite know yet. As we mentioned, the name change just happened. Uh, the new campus in Ontario will open in about a month and a half. Uh, new students will start to pour in for orientation. So it remains to be seen. I appreciated um, everything that she shared with us, and I... we. We pray for her that she works out for herself what's next for Anne Marie. Um, at the time of our interview, it was still rather undecided, and that's the story of a lot of folks around here. We don't get to interview everyone. Uh, as nice as that might be for our project, it just doesn't work functionally. So Anne Marie stands as a representative of staff members for the seminary, alumni, and also people who lived on campus when the campus got sold and who don't really know what's coming next. Some people went down to Ontario. Some people graduated, moved to another job they already had lined up, which is a big blessing. But for many others of us, like Anne Marie, the campus is sold and now, now what do we do? People in transition. That's right. Our next episode is with Grace and Steve Howell a married couple who, between them, are alumni, recent staff, and local ministers in Marin County. July is a big month for our podcast. We're releasing a flood of new episodes, giving you a new one every week right here on your podcasting app of choice, whether that's iTunes or something else, and also on YouTube. Episode 11 with Grace and Steve Howell will be available one week from today on July 22nd. As always, please subscribe so you don't miss an episode and rate or review us so that you can help people find this uh, program if this program has been helpful to you. May God bless you as you go. He's already gone before. <laughs>